Hello, and thank you for joining me uh, today to talk a little bit about what the RRTC on Employment of People with Physical Disabilities is doing related to one of its research studies on customized employment. I am Dr. Katherine Inge, and I am the project director, and we have been working to really have a look at customized employment as it relates to individuals with physical disabilities. And first I'd like to give you just a very brief background on customized employment and uh, where we came from to this point in time today. So I'm pretty sure that most of you listening to me today talk know something about customized employment and how it has been defined. And one of the things that we really hear all the time is that customized employment meets the needs of the job seeker and the needs of the employer. And that is a very straightforward uh, statement that I think first appeared uh, really in early 2001 when ODAP, the Office of Disability Employment Policy, first introduced the term customized employment. And in about 2002, I believe, the term customized employment first appeared in the Federal Register as far as the definition, and this term uh, was defined, as you see on the screen, about it meeting the needs of the job seeker and the needs of the employer. Now, I think this is a really critical factor in customized employment because perhaps sometimes we uh, skew our activities in employment related more to the needs of the employer, perhaps, than the needs of the job seeker. So it's really a weighted process with both of these things having equal weight in the equation of trying to assist someone in finding a job. Another thing that you hear often is that customized employment is not labor market driven. And I remember when I first heard this uh, myself, I thought, well, it has to be labor market driven in some respects uh, in order for us to find jobs for people with disabilities. But I think the real focus is that we don't go out into the labor market seeking jobs with out knowing what the needs, interests, and preferences are of our job seekers. And not too long ago, I heard an example given by an employment specialist, and the example was uh, she presented that they were doing customized employment in their agency, and the example was that they had found out that there was a new, I believe it was a bakery in town. And so they had gone to the bakery and proceeded to customize jobs for people in their agency. And that's kind of what I mean by it is not labor market driven in the sense that without knowing whether anyone in the agency was interested in working in a bakery, they were customizing jobs. Which leads me really to my next point, which is that customized employment is not simply the same as a customizing job, excuse me, same as a customized job. So for instance, they might have gone out into the agency or that bakery, the agency went to the bakery, and they customized a job description without really customizing it for a specific individual. So I think it's critical that we really have um, some of these basic concepts and ideas down when we are talking about customized employment and what we are doing to ensure that we are implementing the procedures correctly or the strategies correctly. And so that probably kind of leads me uh, into what we are doing at the RRTC related to uh, customized employment. Oh, and one point that I, um, that I didn't say a minute ago, really quickly, is that uh, customized employment was added to WIOA in uh, 2014, as I'm sure many of you listening uh, today are aware of, and it is part of the definition of supported employment and its customized integrated 
competitive employment for people with disabilities. The emphasis on integration uh, as well as um, the wages that the individual earns. And, and, you know, we'll get into some of this a little bit later, but I think that that's an important point to remember. So why are we looking at customized employment at the RRTC? Well, uh, a number of years ago, there was a new um, RRTC that was um, approved for funding that we got from Nidler. And the RRTC had never been funded before, and we wrote for this money. And one of the things that we really looked at and thought about was that people with physical disabilities really are unemployed or underemployed at a really high rate. And I don't think that's news to anybody, um, really. We've looked at the unemployment rate for people with disabilities for many, many years. And I think, unfortunately, people with physical disabilities have um, perhaps even a greater, some greater barriers to employment. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, I just have a little laundry list on the screen there about some of the reasons perhaps that people with physical disabilities have uh, difficulties or their barriers to employment. And as an aside, we're also doing another research study on what people with physical disabilities perceive as their barriers to employment. That's um, another study that we're doing. And we've heard these things from people that we have been talking to in focus groups related to their barriers to employment. And some of those things really include um, difficulty performing the essential functions of the job due to their physical disability, the actual environmental barriers. Um, none of these things should be any news. Their physical uh, disabilities per se, as well as the perceived abilities that we as professionals have that people with physical disabilities um, can attain. One of the people in that, uh, in one of our focus groups for people with spinal cord injury gave an example about environmental barriers um, and really um, issues that she faced as an individual with a spinal cord injury. When she um, acquired her spinal cord injury, she had been a realtor. And she lost her job as a realtor primarily because she said, that she can no longer inspect houses. Uh, the example specifically that she gave was that she could no longer go to the second floor of the houses that she might list for sale. Um, that sort of set up my little radar screen and I thought to myself, well, really, uh, that's just an excellent reason why this person needed someone to help negotiate a customized position for her. Because think of all of the technology that exists today related to um, video on your iPhone. She could have perhaps had an assistant that would go to the second floor. She could use her iPhone. Perhaps she could span or scan the, uh, the room and uh, the individual who was the realtor could, uh, could see what the location looked like. There are all kinds of ideas that perhaps if we had someone that could have assisted her in customizing her job and really eliminating some of the barriers for her to, uh, to employment, she perhaps could have been uh, successful in maintaining her position. So that's really one of the reasons why we wanted to look specifically at customized employment for people uh, with physical disabilities. How can we use customized employment to really address some of these barriers um, that they face when they're trying uh, to find uh, employment? Uh, one more comment that I'd really like to, um, to make related to the last comment of uh, the perceived abilities of people um, with disabilities really is the low expectations of um, of people with disabilities that we might have as professionals. And I remember one young man in that focus group who mentioned um, that he um, was recommended to have a job at, at McDonald's. I believe, I don't remember now whether it was his vocational rehabilitation counselor or his employment specialist who had recommended um, that he see if he could find a job at McDonald's when in actuality the person reported during the focus group call that he had a college degree. So oftentimes we 
perceive people um, and have lower expectations for their outcomes than really, um, really we should have. And I think with customized employment, we really begin by looking at the person's strengths and weaknesses. And so perhaps we try, um, or at least we should, not try, we should um, improve our expectations. We should look at people's abilities and not disabilities as, as being um, the driver or director of our efforts to find individuals um, jobs using customized employment. So just real quickly, um, I should say that the work that we're doing at the RRTC really is founded uh, on work that many, many people have been doing um, for many years, really probably way back before even customized employment was mentioned um, by ODEP in uh, 2001. Uh, certainly, I would need to give credit to, um, to Griffin Hemison Associates and Mark Gold Associates for the work that they have done in the area of customized employment. Because we have a wealth of information that's available, we are probably trying to just move forward and taking it to the next level related to, um, to really putting some research behind the concept. And this is also not to say that there aren't many people in the country also researching uh, customized employment, although I do think it is on a more limited um, basis than perhaps, um, perhaps we might expect. So obviously, um, some of the benefits of customizing jobs specifically for people with physical disabilities are seen here on the screen. And I think these benefits are related to anyone for whom we might customize a job. And that is that the business or the employer is more aware of how the person uh, brings value to the business. Um, the person can be evaluated um, based on criteria that's individually determined for that person. So when we customize for, uh, jobs for people, perhaps we even customize the production standard that the individual is, is going to meet. Because one of the things that I often hear from people with physical disabilities is that they simply can't meet the production standard of the jobs as they exist. So really, we are customizing jobs to the strengths of the individual. Now, probably what I have talked about so far is, is not really um, new for you who are listening. But I think important to really consider as we lay the groundwork for moving forward with doing research on uh, customized employment. And my last point related to the benefits is that um, customized employment really eliminates that competition that the job seeker has with other workers with disabilities because we are negotiating an individualized position for the person uh, that we are assisting in finding employment. And so they're not having to compete in the labor market against other people without disabilities. Um, the only thing that I would like to add when just before we, we move forward, before I forget, is in customizing jobs, we want to make sure that we are not negotiating jobs in a business that no one else wants to do, um, or that the uh, individual is just taking because, um, because we are offering it to them. That is not what customized employment is about. Remember, it has to be based on the individualized needs, strengths, preferences. Who is this job seeker, and what does this job seeker uh, want to do, are critical things that we, um, we need to consider when we are doing customized employment. So, let, so just real briefly, um, our first step in looking at customized employment when we decided that we were going to do this research study at the RRTC was to uh, conduct a number of focus groups. And these focus groups were conducted with two groups excuse me, two groups of uh, people. The first group or the first round of focus groups uh, were conducted with those individuals that are nationally recognized experts. Now, 
um, we promised confidentiality to the people that participated in our focus groups, and so I'm not going to sit here and list for you a group of names of people that participated. I'm sure that if I did so, um, that you would recognize their names, and uh, certainly I would like to thank any of you who might be listening that participated in our focus groups. Uh, thank you for participating because without you, we would not have done this first round of focus groups. So we held about, um, or we held, excuse me, not about, we held three focus groups for people that were considered experts, and uh, that included about 14 individuals, and then those individuals recommended people people that um, they perceived or were recognized implementers of um, customized employment. And that included two focus groups of another 14 people that were perceived as really outstanding implementers of customized employment. So what we wanted to do with these uh, focus groups was really hear from people in the field who are doing customized employment. What do they say it is? So that was the purpose um, of the focus groups. All of the focus groups that we did uh, lasted from approximately one to one and a half hours. And we had a set group of questions that we asked, and those appear on the screen um, right there for you. Uh, I would like to add that our study was approved um, by the VCU IRB, the Institutional Review Board, uh, prior to us beginning this, uh, this research. And we asked a series of open-ended questions because we did not want to lead our participants to tell us information um, and, and we wanted to listen to them. So you'll, you'll look up there and you'll see that we did not um, use terms like discovery or informational interviews or job negotiations uh, because we wanted the focus group's participants to give us that information. So we basically said, um, could you tell us what are the specific strategies used in customized employment? Can, can you give us a case study example? And so forth, um, as you see there. And then we had probe questions that we followed up to, um, to try to elicit, uh, elicit more uh, input or content from the individuals that participated. All of our focus groups were held on the telephone using a toll-free number, primarily because uh, we talked to people all over the United States who are implementing customized employment. And so we recorded the calls with the permission of the individuals that participated, and then we transcribed um, those calls. One of our research team members, who is an expert in qualitative data analysis, really did the beginning analysis, and she looked through the transcripts from all of those focus groups that I told you about uh, with the, um, uh, the 28 individuals that participated and developed themes around uh, what people talked about. And then uh, another team member uh, checked her themes uh, for agreement, and then we discussed it as a team before we arrived uh, on the um, really consensus of what we identified as the themes that emerged from the focus groups that we conducted. Um, while I'm thinking about it, I know that there's uh, research going on right now related to um, agreement around the um, components of customized employment. So really, uh, there's, a, there's a really good uh, body of research that's, that's coming together on this topic now. So again, uh, giving credit to other uh, people that are doing similar research and that I think it's really important to, to bring this research together. Um, one comment that I would like to make around the themes that we heard uh, when th we were doing these focus groups, there were some differences in implementation of the strategies that people talked about, but there were specific uh, themes that emerged related uh, to customized employment. And that um, ended up being 11 themes that were identified. Now, um, even though... Um, 
there are 11 themes. They, they're not sequential. It's not like we said theme number one goes to theme number two to theme number three. Uh, it was a fluid process uh, that all of these things were interrelated when we talk about what the themes are in just a minute. Um, I think that uh, one interesting point for me in conducting the focus groups, because in fact I was the one that uh, did all the focus groups and listened to what uh, the participants had to say, the majority of the dialogue that made up our focus groups uh, focused on discovery. And I, I'm sure uh, everyone has heard that term, is familiar with that term. Who is this person? What are their... Um, what are their strengths, uh, preferences, and interests, um, viewing the person from a capacity uh, perspective. So just out of curiosity, before um, I really, uh, or while I was beginning to, to put together what I wanted to say for this presentation, I just looked up discovery in the dictionary. And I'm not going to read uh, those things. Uh, those are three definitions that I found. Um, all, all bearing the same theme that uh, essentially we are uncovering something that we didn't know before, something um, that, um, that has been hidden. And I think it's important um, at this point, and I'll address this a little bit later, that um, discovery is not assessment. And we'll, we'll think about that a little bit more um, later on. But that was a clear message that was given by everyone um, that participated in our focus groups. Um, so let's look at uh, a couple of the um, first core practices that people identified. And I have um, five of those core practices on the screen there. And uh, we have physically meet at the location of the individual's choosing, building a rapport with the person to get to know the individual, uh, mindfully listening to the person, identifying his or her interest, skills, and abilities, and conducting in-depth interviews. So I think um, what I'd like for you just to think about uh, when you think about some of these core practices are things, too, that I have heard uh, from people out in the field when they talk about implementing customized employment. And one of the first things that people um, have asked or have asked me um, is, do you have a checklist that you go through when you go to meet at the location of the individual's choosing? Um, and if you think about it, a checklist is probably contradictory to the whole concept of getting to know the individual. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you might not have a, a checklist that you have sort of jotted out for yourself, or perhaps you even have uh, a checklist that you keep at your agency. But I would really say that when you are getting to know someone, um, sitting in front of them with a checklist to, to, um, to really identify what the person's interest, skills, and abilities are, is really not um, what we want to do. Because think about how you get to know someone in your own social network. We don't sit down with them with a checklist and ask them, about their skills, interests, and abilities. Um, and I was talking to uh, Kerry Griffin recently, and he, uh, he made a comment that uh, I'm going to quote him on. I'm not going to claim it as myself. Um, but one, one thing that he said to me that I thought was really an interesting point is that when you use a checklist, when you're trying to get to uh, know someone, perhaps the um, focus is on what you are writing down. So for instance, you, the, the in person or perhaps someone in his or her uh, network of support um, mentions something and you quickly write it down on your uh, notepad. Well, that could distract the individual that is reporting that information to think, oh, well, that must be really important because they're writing it down. And perhaps they uh, focus or you veer them off into another direction that um, really might not uh, be where they were going simply because you called attention uh, to the, that point when you wrote it, uh, you wrote it down. 
I think it's important uh, to really have open-ended questions, to have a conversation with the person, and to uh, really listen, as it says there, to mindfully listen to the person and uh, to record your comments uh, later on when you are finished with uh, some of these uh, interviews that you conduct with people. Um, I think the uh, critical point for me and um, an example of someone that I met last week, uh, really listening for clues that people give you when they are talking with you simply in conversation. And I was meeting with a young man and his mother last week, and we were doing really just some getting to know you activities. In fact, we were at a fast food restaurant doing a get to know you activity. And um, I was going to schedule a follow-up visit with them to really explore further what some of his interests and skills were. And I asked um, them when they could meet me this week. And um, the mom said, well, we can't meet you on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And um, my ears kind of picked up. And instead of letting that go by, I said, uh, well, what do you, what do you, uh, really, uh, I'm just, what do y'all do on Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays? Is it something um, that y'all really enjoy doing? Because again, you were being a detective here. Uh, you want to find out uh, what those preferences are, what those interests are for that person. Uh, and it actually turned out that on Monday, Wednesdays and Friday, the, um, the parents exercised at a uh, local gym and the individual went uh, as well. He didn't exercise. The, um, they went on to talk about how he was um, greeting people at the door and he was talking with um, people that were exercising, talking with the staff. And she proceeded to, to um, give me a laundry list of all the, the really great things that that person did when, um, when they went uh, to the gym while, uh, while the parents were exercising. If I hadn't done a follow-up question um, to really, I guess, have an open in conversation is my point, I could have missed all those things about that individual. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to immediately rush out and find a job for the person um, working at a gym, but it gave me some ideas of you know, what, what are some things that I might pursue, um, pursue with that person? So really making sure um, that you are asking probing questions. Um, the next point, really, the next two core practices that came out were really observing the person in a number of different environments and arranging for the person uh, to observe at local businesses. Um, and, and this was um, two really important core practices that the participants in our focus groups uh, talked about at, at, a great, um, at a great length. And I think that, um, again, observations are important because they're, they're not assessments. Um, and, you know, oftentimes we may hear things that, um, that people tell us, and then when we observe them, they're entirely different um, than, than what we heard, for instance. The person has a great deal more strengths than what uh, we may have um, known or heard. And so it's important um, really to do observations. And if I um, really go back to my, my thoughts about people with physical disabilities, really just observing the person in um, different places where they go uh, can give me a lot of information about their capacity. Um, you know, how do they open doors? How do they manage um, uh, carrying things if they use a wheelchair for mobility? Uh, do they have um, any, any means or uh, uh, a way to uh, carry things with them, such as a backpack on their wheelchair. Uh, all those things that I want to look at while I am um, observing someone that I don't need to send them for uh, a formal assessment for their physical capacity because I can really observe those things um, in the uh, natural environments. And I think that's really, really important um, to consider. Another thing that I'd really like to mention about observing um, 
people at local businesses or arranging, excuse me, for the individual to observe at local businesses, really do some homework when you do that. I remember um, when, when we were, um, we went, the employment specialist, excuse me, went with one of the individuals that we have, um, that we're assisting in customized employment. He had expressed an interest in going um, to a radio station and working at a radio station. Well, the employment specialist had not done um, his homework related to that. And when they got to the, um, to the radio station, the person got very frustrated because they didn't see anything that, um, that he perceived he could accomplish. So I think it's important to really think about uh, doing some informational interviewing uh, prior to going uh, to some of these observations. And, and that's just my side comment related to some of the things um, that we have found in assisting people to observe um, in environments. Remember, we're trying to uh, look at people's capacities and um, identify things that um, they would want to do with uh, within those environments, and so doing homework before we go is really critical. Uh, the remaining uh, four core practices of the eleven are on your screen here that um, that were identified in the focus groups that that we conducted, and that's observing uh, the person engaging in activities, job-related activities, uh, conducting informational interviews, as I have already mentioned, uh, perhaps doing some uh, brief work experiences, and uh, making sure that you collaborate with the uh, person's uh, pretty much uh, circle of support. Now, I think really related to that is that customized employment cannot be done in isolation. And even um, it's really important to continually brainstorm with the individual, with the person's family and friends and network, even within your own agencies as you are implementing customized employment. So um, really, those are all the core practices um, that that we identified within the context of our focus groups that we conducted. And if you're interested in learning more about those focus groups, uh, you can uh, look on the web page where you access this webcast because we have a summary of the outcomes of our focus groups posted there. So um, really, just a couple of things. I think I've probably already touched on these about the importance of observation. Uh, what you see may be very different than what is said or what, um, what you hear. Um, an example of that might be um, someone that we have been working with whose uh, mother didn't want uh, the employment specialist to come to her home. Now, um, I don't think I mentioned when I was talking about uh, going to a person's uh, place of preference, uh, oftentimes what's recommended is to go to the individual's home. And I think it's very critical to um, observe the individual in the person's home, and perhaps uh, down the road you can do that if the initial preference is not to, uh, not to go to the house. Um, I remember in that particular scenario, um, saying to the employment specialist who was working with the individual, that even though uh, the mother perhaps didn't want her to come to, to the home, that it was very important to go at least drive around the neighborhood. Um, and, and the comment was made, well, the mother says that there's nothing around the neighborhood. And um, I, I grew up in a very small rural community, and if you had asked me when I was growing up if there was anything to do uh, where I grew up, I would say, oh no, I grew up in a town that had less than a thousand people and there was nothing to do. Uh, well, I can assure you, looking back on that, within my community, uh, really within a one mile distance or radius of the uh, home where we live, uh, there was a small town with a furniture store, a dime store, um, all, all kind of, uh, a clothing store. So many, many opportunities that perhaps when we live in these places, we don't see those things. And so it's very important really to be that detective when you are working uh, with individuals doing um, customized employment. 
So just a couple of um, quick comments um, about discovery. I think some of the things that we hear oftentimes is that discovery uh, takes a really long time. Uh, I don't think that needs to be true. I think that we need to spend enough time so that we have a clear picture of the individual and that we don't jump to conclusions about what the person wants to do. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. Um, another thing that people might think is that discovery is an assessment. I, I hope that I've already dispelled that myth. It is really not assessment. It is really getting to know um, the individual. It's individualized and it's really helping that person find their ideal uh, conditions for uh, employment and that it really requires that you have an open mind uh, to what is, um, what is possible for the individual. I think Really, even within the context of some of the individuals that we've been working with in our own, um, own study now, when you ask uh, parents, for instance, uh, what they think their sons or daughters would like to do, and one of the first things that seems to always come up is, well, he could be a greeter. Um, so, you know, that seems, again, that low expectations, we, we're not really sure what to do. We jump to conclusions about what the individual can do. So we need to keep an open mind as we, moved, um, as we move forward. Um, I have a couple of quotes here that I just really wanted to, um, to share with you related, uh, related to our study uh, that people said within the context of the focus groups. Uh, that I guess really spoke to me, and there are more of those if you're interested in looking at the, um, the, the handout that I suggested a minute ago. But essentially, uh, one person said that we really need to make sure that we do not jump to um, just uh, assuming what people want to do. And she described a young woman who, um, who liked to paint with her mouth as, uh, with a mouth stick as her hobby. And so it might be really easy to jump to the conclusion that, that this person would want to be an artist when, in fact, uh, the individual who told the story within our focus group said that that was very far from the truth. So really, we need to not jump to conclusions. We need to move forward and really work with the person um, to, to really uh, find out what they want to do and not assume that some of the things that perhaps we uncover as their hobbies are things that they would want to do for employment. Um, another thing that uh, someone said that I think we all can really relate to is that uh, many individuals particularly those with more significant disabilities, uh, may not be able to tell us what it is that they want to do, uh, which is an even more important reason for us to make sure that we are observing people in uh, environments or uh, places where they like to go and things uh, that they like to do. Um, and the thing about this quote that particularly spoke to me uh, was the, the second part of the quote, which says that it's like you go back to the old bad practice of uh, let me go see if I can figure out some job that I can put you in because you don't know what it is that you want to do. Um, and I'm sure that we have all uh, fallen back on that. We, we find, even tying it back to the previous uh, quote from our focus group where the person said, be sure you just don't assume uh, because the person could paint using a mouth stick that she wanted to be an artist. So really we need to, um, to put on our listening skills. Uh, we really need to really explore things uh, with individuals so that uh, we find out what it is and, and create opportunities. I know that um, you know it's been suggested that, uh, and I think many people have had success with the concept of developing uh, three employment themes for people related to what it is that they want to do for work, and then exploring those themes. Um, I, I think we we have to absolutely not fall into the trap of um, saying, oh, this person is interested in sports, for in instance, and going down only that path of sports, uh, because we have certainly narrowed our focus if we, uh, if we do that. Um, 
This next quote was uh, related to, uh, I guess, it says a couple things to me, related to uh, discovery is not assessment and perhaps that it takes us um, uh, a community, we need to go out into our communities and use resources that exist there. And the example that was given during the focus group was of a um, person who said that he took apart computers and the individual who was telling this story said that he had no um, knowledge of computers himself and he didn't really know whether the person um, really could take apart computers or not. And so he happened to know someone that uh, he connected the, the individual uh, job seeker to who gave him some valid information that indeed that person uh, could uh, effectively build computers and that that was sort of an employment theme or road or path that they should, uh, that they should explore. Um, an example of that uh, from our own research uh, was a young man who uh, was bilingual who came to us and really that was a strength or a skill that he had and so we did explore uh, whether that uh, skill of being bilingual, he happened to speak Spanish, might be something that he could use uh, in a customer service position. But in, in exploring that uh, with him through some informational interviews, uh, through uh, getting him to do um, a, a sort of a, a, a translation of a document that we had, uh, we uh, discovered that indeed this was not something that he wanted to do. Again, not assuming that because he was bilingual that that would be something that he wanted uh, to do for employment. Um, the last quote that I have for you uh, really is related to uh, the importance of networking, albeit um, the previous example was a good example for networking as well. And this particular um, example is of um, someone who did very slow uh, data entry and the person who was assisting her in finding a job uh, happened to speak with her pastor and, and learned that they were entering the history of the church into their computer and that ended, excuse me, being a negotiated job for the individual. What was uh, interesting about that story to me was that um, the the uh, person had actually been a church member when she was a child and the pastor had remembered her. Uh, so really um, networking, networking, networking. The other, um, the other day when the same person that I was meeting with last week that uh, I had discovered I uh, liked to go uh, to the gym when his parents were exercising, his father is an electrician and the, the mother offered up contacts that we could explore uh, in that, um, that father's network. So really not forgetting that uh, customized employment critical to reaching out into our, um, into our communities. So finally, I think, um, in summarizing, I just have a, just a little bit more to say and then I will be, uh, be finished, but the, the sort of end result of the um, focus groups that discovery is capacity-based, not deficit-based, um, it's not spending time administering assessments, taking notes, using checklists, and ranking competencies, and that discovery is um, very much a fluid process. Again, those 11 themes that we identified within our work on, dis on discovery and customized employment, that those are interrelated things that uh, do not uh, occur sequentially. And perhaps sometimes I think that is the most difficult part of really defining uh, what customized employment is because it does have a fluid, a fluid nature to it. So just in summary, and I've already alluded to this, we are or have moved to phase two of our research at the RRTC for employment of people 
uh, with physical disabilities. And we are uh, implementing customized employment as an intervention with transition age youth ages 18 uh, to 24, excuse me, 18 to 24, using a waitlist study design. And what that just essentially means is that we recruited, I believe we have 23 people in our study pool at this point. Um, and we started with a set number of people where we randomly pulled uh, names out of a hat. We began the intervention with that group of people. And as we place people uh, or assist them in finding customizing jo uh, excuse me, customized jobs, uh, we pull an additional name out of the hat. And then we're going to compare the outcomes of the individuals based on um, what support services and needs um, that they have and what we we did to help them uh, in becoming uh, successful. So that's really where we are at um, this stage of the, of the research. Um, I would like to encourage you to go online and look at some of the other webcasts that we have produced on customized employment from the RRTC because there are some, some other, um, other ones there that you might be interested in. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you with a final challenge, and um, that would be to increase your expectations of uh, people with disabilities, physical disabilities, any kind of disabilities as you move forward in customized employment. Um, all of the people that are currently in our pool um, came to us through uh, the Children's Hospital at VCU. And uh, all of them had graduated from school. I believe we may have one person who is still in school. All of them had graduated without employment. Um, they were either sitting at home or they were in or are in day activity programs. So uh, I challenge you as we move forward in this research and as we work with people with disabilities to improve their outcomes and to assist them in achieving their goals uh, using customized employment. So thanks for listening to me. And I would like to turn this over now to Stephanie Lau, who is going to give you a couple of case study examples of the individuals that we have been working with in, um, in this phase two of our study. Thanks so much. Welcome to Customized Employment Case Studies. I'm your presenter, Stephanie Lau, from VCU Rehabilitation Research and Training Center. For our first case study, I would like to introduce you to our job seeker, Jim. Jim's dream job was to be a radio DJ. He was very personable and never met a stranger. In fact, one of his favorite activities was to call radio stations and speak directly to different radio DJs. He also demonstrated excellent computer and research skills. When he was interested in a subject, he would go online and do a lot of online investigation to actually learn a lot about a, an area that interested him. Jim was also very eager to get to work. He had completed some internships and volunteer work since graduating, but wanted something to do regularly where he would get paid. After doing discovery, we talked to Jim about what it was that interested him in becoming a radio DJ. He shared that he liked being artistic, interacting with people, and creating something to share with people. We realized that these skills also translated to social media. Based on this, we expanded his job search from not only being a radio DJ to also including social media positions. After discovery, job development targeted businesses in the area that did not have or had limited social media presence. Splash and Dash had recently come under new ownership. They were a car wash and auto detailing company in Richmond, Virginia. They wanted to share the changes they had made to the car wash to attract new customers as well as retain old customers. They also have a business model that involves a lot of community engagement. They were interested in using social media to share and educate customers on their charitable events as well as deals. It was proposed during an informational interview that a social media position be created for Jim. In this position, Jim would write video scripts, shoot videos with staff, and edit and upload videos to YouTube. In addition, 
Jim also helped research companies in the area with fleet cars to recruit new business partners for Splash and Dash. In the document, you can download a, a sample of the employment proposal that was used for Jim and Splash and Dash. Here is a video showing Jim and his coworkers at work. One of my dreams was to be a radio DJ, but I noticed that I would have to work up to that. And if I'm not a DJ, I would hopefully want to be a music producer. Stephanie came over and talked with us about what are the things that we needed to have done around here and what were the things that, um, that just weren't even being considered. And um, the idea of a social media position came up and I said, you know, we could shoot video, we could put things on Facebook. I, I, I'm a dinosaur, so I had no idea about how to do any of these things. Right now I'm doing a, being like a social media coordinator and doing YouTube, YouTube videos and editing videos and publishing them on to YouTube. Can you pretend? You want me to pretend to be Ashley? Uh, yeah. Okay. We are talking about how to keep your wheels clean. You should always use an all-purpose cleaner to wash your wheels. That's interesting, Ashley. Thanks for that information. This is Jim signing off. He has lots of that you get service in a dash. Awesome. Well, I like the script. Yeah, I wanted the video series to be Ashton as the expert working with Jim as the person who's inquiring and asking all the questions that a customer might have. My name is Ashton and I'm the head detailer here at Splash and Dash Car Wash and Detailer. I think total me and Jim have worked on four different type of projects. Uh, not really how-to videos, but just letting customers know about the services that we provide. Well, I'm working with more my speaking and my people skills because in a video you have to like work on your pronunciation. He doesn't let me miss anything. You know, if I stumble against a word, it's take six, you know, uh, and it just works awesome. I'm not bored all the time seeing at home watching TV. I mean, Tony keeps me busy. Jim wants to work bad. You know, like I've never seen nobody wanting to work as much as Jim wanting to work. Constantly checking in. Am I working this weekend? Are we filming this week? So, I mean, he just constantly stays excited about his job. And Tony here at Splash and Dash gave me a great job opening experience. Now that we have seen Jim at work, let's talk about how he was trained. Jim actually conducted his own online research to identify the best video editing software. He also learned the software independently. His job coach provided structure and guidance initially. His job coach, Chrissy, worked with Tony, the owner of Splash and Dash, to identify video themes and then worked with Jim to develop an interview style. Now that structure is in place, Jim is pretty much in, independent entirely in his job. In this next video, Jim's boss, Tony, talks about job site training and how Jim's position has added value to the business. She helps keep us organized and helps make sure that we're following up on things and um, she's great at keeping notes so that when we have things that need to get followed up on, Jim and I will actually follow up on them. Christy was there to provide uh, a lot of small details that we kind of looked over. So you can move things where you want them to be? Christy helped Jim come up with a template and a structure that became the pattern for all the videos. She was vetting, I think, some of the outcomes to make sure that, that what came back to us was closer to a finished product. Being able to give our customers that knowledge of, of, of taking care of your car and, and how to add value to your car and or just understanding the service we provide for your cars. Hello, folks. Oh, Ready? some people tell me that acid is bad for your wheels. It can be, it can be really bad for your wheels, especially if they're plastic. And 
if they're metal and it stays on them too long, it can actually ruin the surface. We seem to be getting a lot more hits on all of our websites, on, on our website and on our YouTube page and on our um, Facebook page. And when we put out a boost now, we have three and four and 5,000 people seeing them. We literally beat last year's January by 50%. They are really making me feel like I am a big part of the family. It's always nice to have nice bosses that really care about you. The amount of money that we're spending to have these pieces put together um, pales in comparison to the benefit that we find in the experience. In our second case study, we worked with a job seeker, Chris, who was extremely shy when we first started working with him. He was very polite and very soft-spoken. In fact, he was so soft-spoken that it was sometimes hard to hear him. He liked to be very helpful in the home and in the community, especially with his mother. His mother did not speak English, and he provided a lot of translation for her. One of his discovery activities included shadowing a receptionist at a no local nonprofit. During this discovery activity, he confirmed that he did not want to be the main point of contact at a business and would prefer not to have any tasks that required him to be on the phone. Furthermore, he had self-reported that he sometimes had a learning delay. Discovery activities confirm that he was able to learn tasks more quickly when he had a visual support. Additional observation and discovery activities confirmed that Chris was very good with computers and apps on his phone. Based on his interest in helping people and desire to work in an office setting, we approached different businesses that had mostly administrative and clerical duties. One business was a local auto body shop. At the informational interview, we requested permission to observe staff and to talk to them about their positions. Specifically, we wanted to know what tasks were not getting done on a regular basis or were generally not a priority. We observed the customer service position and parts receiving. During that observation, we identified the routine tasks that could be customized into a position to fit Chris's skills and interests. Those tasks included creating customer folders, entering time cards, and posting credits. You can download the attachment of the employment proposal that was created from these observations. Over time, his position has grown and now includes additional tasks that add value to the business. Chris now feels comfortable being on the phone and regularly calls customers and vendors to follow up. Here, we have a video of Chris at work describing his position and how it has changed over time. First, we went to a charity place, um, and I saw how the receptionist was working there. And so that got me thinking if I wanted to be a receptionist or not, because I didn't really feel comfortable in the, um, on the phones. But as time went by and I got this job, I felt a little bit more comfortable. Right, the more the you phone. started doing it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was calling to get credits for parts that had been picked up. 0876. All right, thank you. And then as time went by, I got it. Um, stuff added to what I'm doing. Um, now I'm doing packets for cars that are going to re get repaired. Um, I call vendors to get parts picked up sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I call credits for parts that are, have been picked up already. I sometimes call insurances to get payments. He gives the rest of us enough time to actually get some other stuff done because there are days when the phones are ringing off the hook. Um, he chases money down. He's like a dog with a bone. Um, he's not going to let up until that line is marked off of the report that he runs. Um, they got me calling on credits, and it was they were pretty because they were pretty behind, and they were pretty high, like in the thousands or something. And I kept calling and calling, and I got it down pretty low to like I think it was maybe six dollars or something like that.
Once the position was created, we needed to address what accommodations Chris would need at work. The customer service associates and parts receiving position stood at a desk or sat on a very elevated chair. Environmental conditions were made for Chris. This included finding an accessible desk, giving him a personal scanner and printer for use, and also creating visual supports to help him learn his job. The most interesting accommodation was transportation. His schedule at work was adjusted to accommodate his transportation needs. The local paratransit company that Chris had access to did not cross over county lines from his home to his place of employment. Chris was able to use family support to get a ride to work and his supervisor adjusted his schedule so that it would coincide with when his uncle could get him to work. To get home, Chris uses a phone app called Uzer. Uzer uses Uber and Lyft drivers to schedule reservations and patrons can filter out preferences. For example, Chris is able to identify what drivers are willing to accommodate him and his wheelchair. Chris can transfer himself from his wheelchair into a vehicle, but then would need a driver who would be willing to break down his wheelchair and put it into the trunk or back seat for him. Using Uzer, Chris is able to identify these drivers and tag preferences. Chris also saves and submits his receipts for an IRWI or an impairment related work expense. Here is a video where Chris talks about the accommodations he has at work. Hi right, Chris, so what type of accommodations were set up to help you with your work? So I, I have a, a scanner here. I have my own computer, my own, my own phone. As time went by, they changed me to this area right here, to this desk. And I feel like I like this one a little bit better because it has more room. We just kind of found him a desk and a laptop and made sure he could reach everything he needed to get to and turned him loose. So what did the employment specialist do to help Chris learn the job? <laughs> she spent about three weeks shadowing me so she could learn my job and then she took pictures and printed and did this amazing job aid that I actually used to help other people that were hired after the fact. Um, and then just, you know, I guess put it all into a binder and that was what he went by. At first I was having a little trouble with setting up GRTC to get here because they don't go through this part of town. Um, so I just got my uncle to bring me to work. And so, and then I use um, user to um, set up a reservation to get picked up after work through um, Lyft. Great, okay, and you keep those receipts? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for any other individuals with physical disabilities looking for work? Um, just don't give up. Like, keep going. If you can't find something, just keep trying. Thank you for watching this presentation on customized employment. I hope you found these case studies informative.